Welcome everyone to the third annual Lone Star Lecture Series. The Lone Star Lecture Series is part of the Distinguished Speaker Series here at Angelo State University, and it hosts outside scholars of Texas history to deliver a keynote address coinciding with the anniversary of Texas independence in March of each year, which was just March 2nd. So it is presented by the Dr. Arnaldo de Leon Department of History here at ASU, and is funded by the Dorsey B. Hardiman Endowed Chair in History. We would ask members from the San Angelo community who are here uh, tonight to sign our Friends of the Lone Star Lear series uh, form with your name and email address, so that way you can stay informed about next year's talk. Uh, we are thrilled to announce this year's speaker, Dr. Leah Legrone, who will present her talk, Sex Wages, Race, Respectability, and Minimum Wage Policies in Texas. After her presentation, we'll open the floor for questions uh, from you all, from the audience. Uh, Dr. Legrone is from East Texas, she holds a Ph.D. in history from Texas Christian University. She's currently an assistant professor of history and public history director at Weber State University in Ogder, uh, sorry, Ogden, Utah. Uh, she's thrilled to be back in Texas. She's already had plenty of Mexican food, uh, and she brought the rain with her, uh, so we might not let her back on the plane. Yeah. Uh. So, Dr. Legrone specializes in women and gender, the borderlands, and labor studies. She has contributed an essay uh, to an anthology about Texas Governor James Ferguson, as well as scholarly articles to the Washington Post and Texas Monthly. She has also worked on several public history projects, including the Civil War documentary, Civil Rights in Black and Brown, and the Texas Historical Association's Handbook of Texas Women. Her current book project, which we'll hear about, under contract with the University of Oklahoma Press, is titled Sex Wages, the Fight Over Minimum Wage in Texas, 1919 to 1923. So please welcome me, uh, please join me in welcoming Dr. Legron. Okay, I'm going to set my timer so that I don't go way over or start going off on tangents, which I um, am. Okay. Thank you all for being here. Uh, thank you for being here. Um, I want to thank Michael and Jason and Yulia for uh, helping me get out here. It was quite the ordeal um, coming from uh, Salt Lake City, Utah to um, San Angelo. Uh, but I want to thank you all for coming out. I am going to start where historians usually stop. Oh, look at that. Look at that. There we go. There we go. They aren't, they don't turn up for me. Um, so we, historians usually start, you know, end our discussions with why our history matters, why our scholarship matters and what we do. I'm going to begin it mainly because, and even just today, I visited Miss um, Hattie's brothel or bordello as the, they like to class it up a little bit. Um, and when I told people that I am a historian of prostitution, automatically get the, wait, what? Prostitution? Like, how, how do you get into prostitution? And um, so <laughs> how I got into prostitution was uh, lots of reading about uh, morality, women's morality, uh, what that means, and, and started researching how that is connected with the types of jobs and the types of salary that women earn, right? Uh, and one of the ways that I explain why my work matters is um, the article that I wrote for the Washington Post for Made by History. So right during the pandemic, as we were shut down and the federal government started giving out the small business loans, um, I read this, this news article about how small business loans were not going to be given to women in the sex industry, particularly uh, 
uh, exotic dance clubs or strip clubs because the the law or the bill for this small business loan relief um, specifically it excluded immoral businesses, uh, which ties directly into what I do with connecting prostitution um, to low wages and morality to pay, especially for women. Why I say especially for women and what I argue here is that the business owners, men, mostly men, they were able to get the small business loan. They hired the dancers. The dancers are independent contractors. And so because they're independent contractors, they're considered to having their own businesses within this business, this larger business. The, the male proprietors could get the loans. The women who did the work could not. The labor. And so that's how I connected it to this, this larger um, historical context. So basically what I'm saying is that we're still having these conversations on connecting morality to wages, especially for women, and, and why this is important. So what, how do we connect morality and wages? Uh, it's very large up here. I've never seen it quite this large. But early 19, um, under, early, early 1900s reformers, I'm from the late 1900s, just so you know, um, they attacked the sex industry um, and with the population of prostitutes blamed the women for the state of their perceived immorality. So in the late 1800s, early 1900s, morality and immorality was seen as something that was inherent, especially within the poor, poor whites, especially. And as part of the late 19th century social Darwinism, the wealthy often uh, viewed poverty as a punishment for moral failings of the individual. Then, uh, then for context, you have the social gospel as progressive reformers start to talk about uplifting society as a whole by uplifting the poor. And so the social gospel response to the social Darwinist idea, and I'm going to look down here instead of up here all the time, is this socially constructed or it, it is the opposite of how they viewed immorality and is socially constructed by the middle and upper classes to reflect their views on purity, womanhood, uh, and this is a symptom of poverty, not the cause of poverty. And so that's how this larger discussion is going to shift and create this larger narrative. Um. I found this quote by George Bernard Shaw, and yes, George Bernard Shaw um, is not up here, but it it it's really sums up this larger movement that connects prostitution and low wages in order to get uh, legislation for a protective minimum wage for women, and this is really the idea of what progressive reformers began to adopt the, this mantra, if you will, of what progressive re, uh, reformers adopted. People did not experience poverty because they were immoral. Rather, immorality is forced upon them um, because they are poor. And so this also goes into that larger conversation about prostitution in general. Is this a choice? Did the women, is this a, an agency, a choice that they're making? And I explore that conversation. I don't really get into it, but I do use an argument from this same time period that it, it can't be labeled as a choice. You either die of starvation or choose to commodify your body. So it's a false choice, right? It's a choice forced upon you. And so uh, this is kind of the larger narrative. 
of this time period, but we're going to come back to this quote uh, pretty often. So right now, I'm just going to riff um, on my on the the larger context um, of this minimum wage movement that connected prostitution to low wages, and then we'll get into um, Texas specifically. We're going to kind of go around the nation and come back to Texas. So in this, I'm going to start with this this one and go back to the other one. So in 1910, uh, this is after you have this big federal law uh, called the Mann Act. Anybody heard of the Mann Act? So of 1910. So this is a response, a progressive reformer's response to prostitution. And it's a federal law that criminalizes people um, taking women across state lines for, quote, immoral purposes. It was problematic. Uh, two of the examples that I use of why it was problematic was the boxer Jack Johnson, a black man who was married to a white woman, uh, went across state lines with his white wife. He was arrested and charged under the man. Um, and that was completely racially motivated. Another way that they used the Man Act was to charge women and men who travel together, specifically labor organizing. So a lot of the Wobbly, um, International Workers of the World, also known as the Wobbly, there was quite a few of them because often men and women traveled together. So in order to kind of punish these labor organizers, they were arrested and charged under the Mann Act, assuming that these men were escorting these women, the working class women, across state lines for immoral purposes. The Mann Act was not used very often for its actual purpose. Um, but it was a moral panic, right? Why did we have this moral panic? And I'll come back to this. I have some pretty interesting, um, this is where I get into numbers. I'm not really a numbers person. But I think they tell a really good story if you really look at them. Why did this moral panic start in the first place? Um, progressive reformers love their conferences. They love their survey. They love sending people into these slum areas to do research, right? And so part of this is going to come from this Chicago Vice Commission report. And I'll go back to that in just a minute. But what was the moral panic? The moral panic was now that we have industrialization, right? And we have these cities that are getting the, you know, trains are coming through, factories are being built, all of this industry is coming to these cities. Now you have women, native-born white women, let me be specific, coming into the cities looking for work. You have, from rural areas, you also have immigrants, um, loads and loads of immigrants coming into the nation to capitalize on this on industry um it was very limited though women and their work uh they could go into factories to garment factories work piecemeal they could do steam laundry steam laundries was a huge industry here um and other very low paying jobs Black women across the nation were relegated even further to lower lower paying jobs. And then as we get into Texas, you can see you'll see that Mexican women the same, relegated to very low paying jobs. That was not the moral panic. The moral panic was around white women moving into the cities, especially from rural areas, going into the cities and the fear of 
uh, madams or procurers from brothels, um, meeting them at the train station and then bringing them into brothels and capturing them in the brothels, making them work in the sex industry. So that was the whole moral panic. Um, and around that moral panic, they did tons of uh, research that, of course, then helps me. So what you see here is borders. So one of the ways that they're tracking women adrift, and by the term women adrift, I mean uh, single women moving into the city who do not have a moral compass. Anybody know what that moral compass consists of? A man, right? So they're moving away from their dads, their brothers, um, any other male uh, male protector that gives them their moral compass. <laughs> Let's not talk about how many women were sexually abused by men in their family and then labeled as fallen women. Um, and so in order to make money after you're labeled a fallen woman, you commodify your body. But we don't talk about that. Um, so the fear in these women adrift, specifically white women adrift. And so by city, because a lot of these cities are going to form their own vice commission. Did I just go out? Can you all still hear me? Okay, um, they're going to form their own vice commission. So what you see is women moving to cities, going to boarding houses. Fun fact, brothels were also labeled as boarding houses. So that was one of the fears. But you can see these numbers. Um, and with these numbers staring them in the face, it became a real, like, we really need to do something about this because women are susceptible to falling into prostitution for not being paid a living wage. Then you go to a uh, marital status. It's a real fear that by 1910, um, the average age of single women is still 29. They're not getting married and having babies. They're not getting married, and so they're not connected to a man who is their moral compass, right? Um, but is it just young, single women? No. So separated and divorced, widowed, all of these women, especially white women, I need to point out, it's a real fear that they um, may turn to prostitution to be able to survive. Why? Men are not only considered the moral compass, men are considered the economic center of these women's lives. They don't make as much money as men because men are considered the breadwinners. Women, women's income is supplemental. Even back in this time, women were fighting middle-class white women we're fighting for equal pay for equal work. Um, so that's a term that's been around for a long time. <laughs> Excuse me. I have not talked like this in a while. Why white women? Um, the numbers here tell me a great, a big story, a great story. Um, black women are, this is, 1880 to 1910, the majority of black women are still living in rural areas of the South. This is before your great migration is taking place. Um, women are moving into these larger, black women are moving into these larger cities, but the percentage is not there yet. And the, I don't know specifically where this sample is taken from. It could just be taken from certain areas that have already segregated black women and white women, and so they didn't go into um, these larger black populations. But what you but what this does tell me here: foreign-born white, native-born white, 
uh, with foreign born parents or native born parents. So this is the time period here that progressive reformers are bringing foreign born white skinned women into the umbrella of whiteness. And so it's a, it becomes imperative to protect white women, especially when you look at this numbers, the fear of white slavery. Um, so women being forced into the sex industry, white women. And what's really helpful to me and my own research is that in 1880, 1890s census is pretty much burned up, so we don't have a lot of that. And the 1900 census, prostitution is listed as a, an occupation. And so that's really helpful to me. Um, only because then I have to use the 19, to use the 1910 census, I have to go back to the 1900 and the 1880s to see who the madams were. And then I can trace them and I'm like, oh, you're probably still a madam, right? Um, and your borders are sex workers. But you can see the, the occupations that are available to women. Um, prostitute, 4%. That's a big deal. 4% is a big deal. Especially when you, like the, 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 the laundresses, the sales women, they're only a couple of percent numbers higher. School teachers are 4%. These are women who are on the edge of what they consider legitimate jobs and falling into prostitution because they don't get paid very much. So let's go back to my larger, my other discussion. So with all those numbers in mind, the, a lot of cities did. Um, Chicago's Vice Commission report was the most famous. Once they published in 1911, it became a bestseller. People loved reading about sex work. Um, but the Vice Commission had this one paragraph, one paragraph in their report that sent both progressive reformers and businessmen over the edge in different directions. The businessmen actually tried to get this paragraph removed from the report, and the progressive reformers latched onto it and ran with it uh, for a new outlook on prostitution, on, on the abolition of prostitution. Spoiler alert, neither the Mann Act or this actually ended prostitution. Um, but they tried. They were, they, they were trying to make these legitimate efforts. But what the Chicago, when the Chicago went into the Levy District, which was the most famous red light district in the United States at the time. So the Levy District in Chicago, on the south side of Chicago, um, very powerful madams there. Uh, the, the political machines ran these areas, madams paid off the political machines. There was a lot of power coming out of this red light district. Progressive reformers sent some investigators down to the red light district to investigate the sex industry. Like, hey, what y'all doing? What's going on? Let me talk to you. Uh, let me buy you a drink. Um, that's a song, by the way. Uh, and so they came up just by talking to some women in the red light district, they came up with this idea that most of the women that are, have fallen, soiled doves, if you will, um, did so because the industries that women could work in were paying what they called starving wages. And so women had the choice to either starve or commodify their body. There's a, um, and so this caused all kinds of upheaval in discussions around protective wages. 
for women. So in 1913, um, Chicago, the Lieutenant Governor Barrett O'Hara, who ran in the Progressive Party on the Progressive ticket, he formed his own white slavery commission with the state of Illinois in order to specifically get a federal law that was about protective wages to to have a federal minimum wage law for women to keep them from going into prostitution. He held these hearings in Chicago. He, his hearings are some of the only hearings that I have found where they actually allowed women from the red light district to testify. So he got so angry. Barrett O'Hara got so angry at the business owners um, for denying that paying $4, $4 a week to women, that doesn't make them immoral. They're just inherently immoral. And if they weren't immoral, then they would rather die than sell their body. And so Barrett O'Hara got so angry that he sent his sergeant in arms to the levy district to round up some women and bring them in. Caused all kinds of controversy. But this one woman that is um, identified as AR, they only use their initials, she told the committee, she said, I worked in a steam laundry until I was 24 years old, making $4 a week. I now work in a brothel for $40 a week. I send my children to boarding school, to private boarding school. Yes, I don't have contact with my children. No, I can never see my children again, but my children will not experience poverty. My children will be able to get out of this cycle and go on and make a living. And so that's how she really justified was she was, you know, choosing to go into the sex industry. It made a huge impact. And so for a, a woman that worked in the red light district to make an impact on this national discussion is huge. And so by 1913, now you're that because of the first Chicago Vice Commission report, and then these white slavery commissions, I told you progressives love their commission, um, they, it starts a movement. It starts a national movement that's connecting prostitution, abolition of prostitution, to low wages paid to women. And then you get um, the West. So the West, as you can see here, where women could already vote uh, for these kinds of laws. These Western states are going to pick up this progressive platform and they are going to start passing their own laws, whether they were a flat rate of minimum wage or industrial welfare commissions or just a labor commission. But all of these states here are going to pass some form of minimum wage for women. And then you've got Texas. Let me go back. None of these states here had exclusions to their laws on minimum wage. Now they did specify them for certain industries. It is understood that these laws are for white women for, you know, white women to have access to this minimum wage, but it's not coded in their laws. And then there's Texas, right? And then there's Texas. Now, I use this tree planting region map <laughs> because it's the only one I could find that was broken up into regions, but it really is indicative of these other regions that are <laughs> other types of regions that are going to pop up. So in 1919, no, 
1913, 1915, and then again in 1919, Texas is trying to get this progressive reform passed, these protective wage laws. They got the protective hours laws passed. Now they're trying to get the protective wage laws passed. But this brings up, for historians, that age-old question. You know what that is about Texas? Is Texas the West or is it the South? It's a great question. But I don't really engage in it other than saying that Texas brought in Western ideas. They were looking at the West saying, look at what the, these Western states can do, especially if women can vote. Look at what they can do. Let's bring in these progressive ideas that the West is passing into our states. Yeah. But Texas politics and, and social norms of the time are deeply rooted in the Jim Crow South. Deeply rooted in the Jim Crow South. Most of your politicians are kind of come from this eastern corridor. If you ever been to East Texas, it can't tell the difference between Louisiana, Alabama, and East Texas, right, geographically. And so it's very much rooted in Jim Crow politics. And so Texas wants to pass these uh, minimum wage laws for women, protective wage laws for women. So in 1919, the Labor Commissioner T.C. Jennings, and I think I have a picture of him. There, there he is. Uh, T.C. Jennings stands up before Congress and says, the number one imperative thing that we have to do this legislative session is get this passed. Get this legislation, this protective wage for women, passed. Um, and... By 1919, they, they started agreeing with him, right? Um, wasn't it that women could vote in state politics? We talked about that. Um, Annie Webb Blanton here, whose um, name is on a building at the University of Texas uh, at Austin, she, before women could even vote, she was voted in as the first woman um, superintendent of all schools of Texas. So she's over the education system. Let me tell you a little bit of something about Annie Webb Blanton. Uh, for the Texas education system, she wanted an English-only curriculum, right? Uh, she also was part of the United Daughters of the Confederacy. And so she was very adamant about uh, being part of the, uh, the old South right? She, she is a lost causer. And so she, her, her politics and T.C. Jennings' politics, while they are labor-minded and, you know, wanting to protect the working class, it is very much about protecting white women in the working class. Even T.C. Jennings, who seems to be really progressive, now, this, this is where this map comes back into play. So in 1919, after the minimum wage law is passed and the Industrial Welfare Commission is formed with T.C. Jennings um, and Annie Webb Blanton and then somebody else named Hunt, but he doesn't last very long, uh, and I couldn't find a picture of him, but he represented the business owners, so we're not going to talk about him anyway. Um Anyway, Blanton was supposed to represent the working class woman, which is really interesting since she was um, from an upper class white family. And then T.C. Jennings represents labor. Um, one of the things that the Industrial Welfare Commission is going to propose is that to, to appease um, the, the white Southerners that uh, are worried about this minimum wage law and and um, oh my my thing went blank there so I'm gonna keep looking up here um this minimum wage law is to divide the state up into zones okay to uh to 
pay certain zones of women more than other zones. Can you guess which zone was the lowest paid? South and West Texas. Um, and that that's where we're going to get into the discussion of Mexican women. So again, I argue in my larger project that Texas is an interesting case study for for this particular law and this legislation because there is like this tri racial tri uh, triangulization that they are contending with, which a lot of your other other um, southern states have this like black white binary that uh, that they're addressing. You also have uh, Mexican Mexican American in Texas. Uh, who, on paper, are racially white. Texas, uh, the Texas business owners along the border, along these zones, are going to make a concerted effort to separate Mexicanness from white, uh, particularly around this law. And that's what I argue. Now, Jim Crow politics. For black women, shout out to uh, Rebecca Sharpless, who was my dissertation advisor, uh, who wrote two books that were really important to my research. Black women are excluded from the beginning. So when white legislators, the men of Texas, write this law the first time, this law was written by uh, two people from East Texas, one from Hemp Hill, one from Houston, my, uh, I theorize that they were working together because Hemp Hill rural women were moving into Houston looking for work. And so it's part of this moral panic. The two, they didn't, they didn't say in the legislation that black women were excluded. What they did is they coded it in the exclusion of certain industries. The other states of the West only had what industries were included. Texas not only had what was included, but also who was excluded. Specifically, who was excluded. So how did they do that? Domestic workers and farm and ranch labor workers were excluded. We're specifically looking at East Texas. Uh, North and East Texas, North Texas, East Texas. Guess who was relegated to those industries? Black women, right? And so they're going to be excluded from access to this law. Um, the Industrial Welfare Commission in 1919, let me go back to our state, uh, in 1919, they are going to set out on a campaign to study the industries of Texas. Let me see how much are we doing good on time? Um, study the industries of Texas. So what they did is they are going to go to places like Houston. Houston was first. Then they're going to go to Dallas. And then they're going to go to Waco. And that's all of Texas, right? That's all we have to study. Um, those three cities can tell us everything we need to know about Texas. Um, and Mexican women in El Paso said, not so fast. Not so fast. We know what's going on. We're reading the newspapers. Spanish language newspapers are printing this as well. You need to come to El Paso. Um, workers in Laredo said, you need to come to Laredo and study our industries as well. And so in October, the Industrial Welfare Commission went to Houston to do their first hearings. By the end of that month, Mexican women, Mexican-American women in, um, in El Paso are organizing a strike, a laundry strike. They get over 500 women to walk out of the laundry in El Paso 
um, not only demanding the minimum wage, demanding more money, but this, this is going to get the attention of the Industrial Welfare Commission. And so the Industrial Welfare Commission, they're like, okay, okay, we will go out to El Paso. When they do, it's going to change the narratives. It's going to change this shift, this shift in how progressive reformers at the time are going to talk about this connection between prostitution and the minimum wage legislation. It's going to be less about protecting white supremacy through protecting white women with wages and protect to protecting white supremacy by denying black and brown women access to a living wage. Because what comes with economic security? Political power. Political power. And so this walkout, and this is the only time that I'm going to read because I think it's really important um, that you know that these women are standing up for themselves. So for context, I want to point out that in 1919, this is the same time as the Canales hearings. Have you heard about the Canales hearings? I think um, last year's speaker, um, Dr. Lavario talked about uh, the Porvenir massacre um, conducted by the, uh, the Texas Rangers that sparked the Canales hearing. So uh, Canales was the only Mexican-American on um, in the Cong in Texas Congress. Uh, he and other um, Mexican-Americans along the border, middle class Mexican-Americans, knew about these Texas Ranger atrocities uh, that were happening and and ordered an investigation. So this is kind of the, the dynamic and the politics along the border at the time. So that's for context. Now, what you have for this time period is a whole bunch of white people, white men especially, business entrepreneurs, coming into West Texas, especially along the border, and starting businesses, right? Hiring Mexican women, especially uh, as, quote, cheap labor with the train, you know, the railroads that are coming through that are being built more and more of this uh, white movement into the West is happening again for context. Now, when the Industrial Welfare Commission gets to El Paso, the first people to testify in front of the commission are going to be white employers. White employers, especially of steam laundry, because that's where this big strike happened, are going to argue because the state of Texas excluded black women, that Mexican women also needed to be excluded. And their reasoning. So this is the part that I'm going to, to read because I think it's really important. So they elected, the business owners elected um, F.B. Fletcher to read a statement that he prepared uh, from the heads of Acme, El Paso, Troy, and Elite Laundry. Fletcher stated that his testimony covered the position of the local employers and emphasized three basic concerns. The first was the, quote, unusual local conditions of female workers in El Paso, end quote, he stressed that Mexican women who made up a good portion of the workforce lived in, quote, lower class lifestyle than white women. They used beans and rice and tortillas as an example. Um, next, he addressed the notion that the employers wanted to present their own, quote, reliable and certified data, implying that the commission should not trust the data collected by their own investigator. Um, and last, he thought that the commissioner should know that the, quote, efficiency of women's labor, meaning Mexican women, in El Paso was significantly less than that of the American, meaning white. 
I want to emphasize that the language used here is threefold. American, Mexican, and Black. So Black women are not even put into the American category. Mexican women, whether they were in Texas for generations, are not put into the American category. So American become American identity and the, the label of American becomes a euphemism for white. Um, and it's all in this uh, language being presented here. So Fletcher read this prepared statement claiming, quote, the American and Mexican cannot justly be placed on the same footing. He's going to continue. El Paso naturally accumulated a large amount of unskilled labor. We are confronted with the deep-seated um, difference in temperament existing between the Anglo-Saxon and mixed Latin races. The difference between the progressiveness and initiativeness, I don't know what that is, um, and energy of the former and the backwardness of the Mexican. There seems to be no material desire to learn, to understand, to develop and progress. In some plants, well-defined and intelligent efforts at welfare work have been persistently made and have been met with indifference and distrust. I wonder why, right? Women will not use women, white women, will not use the restroom because they're uh, because of fear of stealing. Mexicans are not steady workers and arrive and rarely rise to a responsible position. No mention of their not being promoted purposefully. Um, my statement is not an indictment of Mexican workers, just plain. Uh, women workers, specifically Mexican workers, Mexican women here, I do want to emphasize that they were standing up for themselves, not only through these walkouts, but they testified. Um, they testified about being exploited, about making half of what white women uh, workers in El Paso uh, were working, and their, their testimony through an interpreter, Clemente Izar, who was uh, the uh, South Texas, South and West Texas head of the American Federation of Labor um, in Texas at the time, he comes out to El Paso to translate for Spanish-speaking women. And so Maria Valles, and so I want to read this part too so I can make sure that I'm um, giving their voice to this topic. Mar Maria Valles, um, in her testimony, she asserted that I work at Elite, la elite Laundry for $4.50 a week. I have a nine-year-old daughter, and some days I have to go without food so that she can eat. Um, Manuela Hernandez uh, told the commission that she was the highest paid me Mexican worker at Acme Laundry, but that employers paid American women more, American meaning white, she testified most Mexican women only made between 4 and $6 a week in the laundries. Espina Silva, Maria Santos, Bendencia Garcia, they all worked at El Paso Laundry but quit during the strikes um, in October of 1919 to protest the low, low, low wages. All three stated that they lived at home. So they used this privilege to quit and help lead this organized effort. Um, but other women couldn't do that. So Guadalupe Espejo, uh, she told the commission, I work at a laundry for $7 a week on the collar machine. My child has two pair of shoes um, that I bought in installments, and my coat is 10 years old. And then the last working woman to um, testify, uh, Spanish-speaking working woman, was Eloise Alcala. And she lived with her sister and her sister's children. And she stood up and told T.C. Jennings, the only fair wage to pay women in this city is $25 a week. T.C. Jennings looked at her and said, what would you do with all that money? She said, I would buy groceries. I would buy groceries. This was really um, impactful. However... The business owner statements were given more authority. And so the Texas legislature went back um, in 2021 
reworked the legislation uh, to exclude Mexican women. It became so convoluted. Also, I do want to point out that black women were not given the right to testify uh, for their for their own uh, voice to be in these hearings. Um, but in, for these testimonies, while, while they were powerful to the to a lot of the public, especially the progressive public, the legislature, all men, all white men, except for Kamalas, um, did did not think so. So they reworked the law, reworked it, dismissed the IWC, um, created this law that was so convoluted that by the time it, it did pass, but by the time it landed on Pat Ness's death, he vetoed it, saying that it constituted class legislation. So protecting, basically, what well, I guess that's super political, but basically what we're seeing in um, some of the legislation that we see now, in uh, this would give advan- too much advantage to working class people. And we don't want that advantage to lift them above white men because then they would be oppressed, right? And so he vetoes it. It goes away. By 1923, you have a uh, contest to challenge um, these, these laws. So Atkins versus Children's Hospital in 1923 um, goes in front of the Supreme Court. In a 4-3 decision, they rule it unconstitutional. Uh, that you cannot have a law specific to women, um, specific to working class women, that gives them an unfair advantage. And so by 1923, you have this, this talk of minimum wage legislation going away until the Great Depression. And so my epilogue to my larger project talks about the legacy of the, t- of the 1919 legislation and the exclusion of Black women specifically, but Black and Mexican women. Um, so the connections that I make are some very powerful men John Nance Garner, Cactus Jack, right? Um, uh, Martin Dyes Jr. Um, and Joseph Mansfield, J.J. Mansfield. All part of legislatures um, when this 1919 bill was passed in Texas, all part of the anti-labor movement, you know, um, anti-black, uh, anti-immigrant movement that's happening at this time. But there is a real discussion about the Great Depression and New Deal legislation of getting this law, this Fair Labor and Standards Law. But how do we do that? How do we do that? Because the South, the the the, gov- the legislatures of the South are like absolutely not because this gives again with economic security comes political power right so what do we do what model do we have what model do we have how do we write this bill to exclude black and mexican people bonk Texas. Texas powerful legislators say, hey, we have an idea. We've already done this in 1919. Right? And so they do. They passed the Fair Labor and Standards Act. Uh, for reference, I put in here that the 25 cents an hour that was originally passed is equivalent to $5.41 in 2023. Um, Increase the 30 cents, which is about $6.59, which is not too far off from the minimum wage that we have now. Um, and of 725, 
if of course we kept pace and this is i just plugged this into google a calculator and it did it for me um it's about ten dollars and 31 cents right and so and so it it broadens the discussion right of morality and living wages and poverty and this this larger discussion of how we talk about not only women's wages but how it's still racially coded how if i go all the way back to the beginning of my powerpoint how it's still morally coded and who gets access so that's my larger arguments that's my larger project and it's still an unanswered question yeah so thank you do we have time for questions i think i go i think i went over that last question so hard There we are. All right, any questions? Fine. So I saw a statistic um, on one of your charts earlier talking about the population of women that are in Chicago, and the minimum age it started with was 15. Let me see, so I can understand. Go ahead. So there's a, on one of your charts, you had the statistic of the number of women in Chicago and the minimum age was 15. I'm wondering if there was any particular fervor against prostitution for underage girls at that time, or was it just grouped with? That's a great question. And I'm going to answer it like this. There was a discussion largely of what even was underage, right? Um, uh, many of your young women that are moving into the, the big cities are going to be 14, 15, and 16. Understand that at the same time, progressive reformers are also fighting for an age of consent law. So in a lot of your states, the age of consent is 12. Oh. So um, women are considered uh, sexually viable and able to be married off to men at 12 years old. And so, which then is interpreted as that's not underage, right? 12 years old is of age. And so, so at the same time that this, there's this moral panic about young women, and I use that term loosely, um, moving into the cities looking for work, there's also that discussion of raising the age of consent to 18. And so, which would then make 18 anything under 18 um a minor does that help answer the question a little bit there was a concern but uh they they couldn't they couldn't say that these were underage girls at 14 15 and 16 because legally they weren't Other questions? So when you talked about sort of what jobs were coded as like black or, or whatnot, can you give like more of a description of like what jobs those were? Like I imagine domestic was one of them or like maybe a cotton picker. What, what was that? What were they really? Um, go, I coded and then what was the other part of the question? The sound system is... Oh, sorry, like, what were the coded jobs? Like, in, in, what were they? Mostly the coded jobs are going to be uh, the ranch's farm labor. So, you know, uh, black women working in cotton farms of uh, uh, um, North Texas and the, the black, what they call the black prairie. And then, of course, in South Texas, um, working in those types of, of farm industries and and domestic labor um because in texas black women 
were not hired into different industries. Mm-hmm. Um, but the industries that other women, white women, and some Mexican women um, could work in. So there were a few laundries, steam laundries, that it, in Houston, say, that were hiring Black women to work. Uh, they argued or they lobbied for steam laundries to be coded as domestic labor since it was laundry um, so that any any in part of the industry that were was hiring black women, they wouldn't have to pay a minimum wage to black women. Um, and so the legislature, understood that black women could only be would only be hired in these specific jobs and by excluding these jobs that made it even more likely that it would only be uh black women that would occupy those jobs uh because if other industries were included in the wages then they wouldn't hire black women they would only hire white women because that was who they were trying to protect right so then it would become even more relegated um and while it's coded they knew exactly what they were doing and the reason that i know that is because of all the news articles that says don't worry folks this is only for white women right so let's pass the legislation. Other questions? So whenever you um, have your um, chart up there and it's saying like foreign white women, what specifically are they asked saying or targeting? go back right here yes hey right. and what 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 was the question what specific are they like german dutch coming in is it asian uh, is it no it's it's mostly your um, central and western european so uh during you know you had a lot of um like your British and Scottish are coming over in earlier time periods, but with the Industrial Revolution and the cities that are that are industrializing, you're getting a lot of more uh, Mediterranean area. Um, you're getting uh, Greeks and Italians and um, and Polish and uh, Russian and and German, some German and. Uh, in the beginning of the progressive era, they are racially coded. So, so foreign immigrants from these areas are considered non-white. But the population of native-born whites is dwindling. And so what are you going to do to have a, quote, white population grow? You're going to Americanize. This is where the Americanization ideas are are starting to form as well. Um, eugenics, you know, how are we going to broaden the idea of whiteness? This is why taking away the whiteness status for Mexican women is so important. And now you have um, you have uh, stats like this coming out that says foreign born white. So now it's bringing um, anybody with white skin, um, coated white skin, into this larger umbrella of whiteness. And so now they get to claim, they, they claim that whiteness. And, and they're given the same types of uh, privileges as native-born white women. Uh, this is kind of a two-part question. First of all, were some of these minority women, when they would go to work for the brothels, were they ever arrested or have any criminal punishment uh, thrown against them? And if they did, would you say that contributed to the fire that was these protests that were 
being carried out around the state in response to the 1919 legislation. So, uh, minority women, no. Um, having studied a lot of red light districts, <laughs> historian of prostitution here, uh, having studied red light districts across the state, the majority of sex workers in these red light districts were white women. Um, foreign born or native born, they were white women. Very few black women uh, were uh, were sex workers. Um, the few, uh, several of the the ones who who worked in the sex industry, black women became madam. Um, which was a whole different controversy, especially when uh, you have black women over white prostitutes. The fear was that they would allow black men access to white women. And even though that these were sex workers, the idea of black men having sex with white women was more than some could handle. And so there was a concerted effort to try to segregate um, segregate, uh, bra or segregate brothels, segregate red light districts. Uh, I have a great quote. I told them, uh, my hosts, uh, the other night, I have a great quote from Houston that said that they wanted to segregate red light districts because they did not want the red, the, the vice district to be a, what did I say? An example of integration, like integration working. Right. Um, there I have I have some madams that were light skinned black women changing their res racial designation to white uh, so that they could continue to operate their brothels. But there the minority population, minority as in black and Mexican in red light districts is minuscule. So it, it's minuscule. So the the fear and which which sparked the legislation sparked the fear because they see based on the this this statistical evidence they see that the majority of women working in the sex industry are white women. If they were black women or Mexican women, this legislation probably wouldn't have even that this connection this legislation probably wouldn't have even come up. But this is about protecting white women. We have time for one more question, I think. I can do two if you want. <laughs> I'm going to leave third away. Okay. Um, so I have a question about two events in the 19 teens and the ways that they would change demographics. Question of how they might have changed demographics in Texas and how that might have changed the conversation about minimum wage for women. One would be the impact of World War I and then the aftermath of World War I with regards to the Great Migration. And then my other question would be about the Mexican Revolution itself um, and those first labor contracts that come out of the first Bracero program and the ways that that would have um, changed the demographics in cities in Texas, that you have more incoming Black and Mexican women coming into Texas, and how by 1919, that might be a different conversation than it would have been in 1910. Absolutely. Um, and so th this, is a, this is a big conversation. Um, we're also talking about Houston. So there's not a, a huge... Houston and Dallas, there's not... A, a, a huge decline in uh, black population there. There is, of course, in the rural areas, um, but uh, Houston especially has a very powerful black middle class. Uh, surprisingly, enough, or not surprisingly at all, really, uh, the red light district um, by 1908 is put in Freedman's Town, so the fourth ward in Houston, which is uh, where black men and women, especially middle class black men and women, live at the time, um, and so it it does it it does affect the conversation of what's happening with the Great Migration. But you in Texas, especially in East Texas and these part, you you still have a a 
very large number of black men and women uh, living in these cities. Um, they are segregated, of course, but uh, but a very powerful black middle class as well. I've got tons of um, black preachers that are talking about having the red light district there, that are talking about this progressive uh, reform for their for their own women. They're starting, uh, you know, YWCA's. They're starting uh, travel aid to protect their own girls uh, from from falling into prostitution as well. The Mexican Revolution is a big part of the in the discussion in my larger project, but because it is, it it excuse me, it's it's important to understand the dynamics of the violence on the border especially the violence towards mexican men and mexican women uh the labeling of uh especially of mexican men mexican american men as as bandits um and so there's this like larger um effort to socially criminalize where it, even if they couldn't uh like legally criminalize all Mexican and Mexican Americans that lived on the border or were coming across the border because of the revolution, they could socially criminalize them by by labeling them bandits. And so that's part of my uh, my larger discussion because it is really important to the discussion about women and Mexican women being excluded because they don't want the white business owners especially are arguing that by giving Mexican women a living wage, contributing to the family wage, that white supremacy will be damaged in Texas because of the political power that comes with it. So protecting white supremacy overall means denying black and brown people a living wage. Um, that protects white supremacy more than keeping white women out of prostitution. So that becomes that that larger shift that the Great Migration and the Mexican Revolution contribute to. Thank you. One final question. Could you explain how Asian women were factored to the discussion of immorality? Because you mentioned that most states other than Texas, there was that binary between white and black. But how were Asian women or Asian people classified within that discussion? So in the West, they are not mentioned in any of this legislation that I can find. Uh, I don't really study the West as much. Uh, but most of the legislation that I can find, Asian women are not mentioned. Um, as far as Texas... Another project that I have going on at the same time, please somebody tell me to stop, um, is um, the steam laundries, right? So we talked a little bit about the steam laundries. But one of the main reasons to get steam laundries into Texas was to push out the Asian laundries, Asian men. Uh, because uh, by the time you get to, what is it, 1869, so Transcontinental Railroad, um, you get 1877, you have more railroads being built through Texas into West Texas. With those comes Asian workers, right? Um, Asian workers working on the railroads. Um, some of those Asian workers stay. Many do not because of the very contentious racial dynamic in Texas. Plus, you have that, you know, the the leftover fear of the Chinese Exclusion Act, uh, the fear that they're going to come up to Mexico, right, and invade um, this immigration invasion of Texas, of Asia. And so you have that leftover fear. So there's a very contentious uh, relationship with, with Asian men, especially. Um, there's more Asian men that are here because of the railroads, and then so those that stay often um, open laundries, uh, the the laundries, and so and all of the newspapers, which is very disturbing, especially for West Texas, 
they're calling for more steam laundries. They're calling for more white entrepreneurs to open these steam laundries. Please, please open these steam laundries. And it's specifically to push the Asian laundries out, the Chinese laundry men out. Well, thank you so much, everyone, for coming. And uh, let's give Dr. Legrone a final applause. Thank you.